Ah, oh, so cool to see so many people here. I mean, it was a little short notice, but it's great to see you all here. How are you all doing? Pretty good, yeah? Cool, because I'm about to say like, oh, my clicker is not doing the thing. Now it's doing the thing. I'm gonna say like, Dobre Veče. Very nice to be here again. I'm really, really happy that Danilo invited me again. Uh, so I apparently didn't do too bad last time. I mean, I changed my last name just to be sure that he doesn't recognize me, but he does recognize me, so. And he still got me back into this meetup, so I guess I'm doing fine. As Daniela said, my name is Martin Splitt. Um, last time I was here, I worked for a tiny, tiny company. I am no longer really working for a tiny, tiny company. I'm a developer advocate, or developer avocado, as some people say. Um, I like avocado, you know, so why not? And I work for the web ecosystem team at a small uh, startup from Mountain View that is called, oops, uh, sorry, that is called Google. Um, and what does the web ecosystem people do, especially in Devra? So you might know people like uh, Surma or Jake Archibald or Mariko or um, all the other lovely people, Katie, Crystal. These people, are actually Crystal is in the web content ecosystem, I think, anyway. So like a bunch of these people are in the web platform teams. They are mostly working around Chrome and the new features that we are shipping and best practices in, in the web development space in general. The web content ecosystem does a little bit of that, but we also talk to companies like publishers, startups, large companies, newspapers, to make sure that if you are coming with your content to the web platform, you can be successful by people discovering your stuff and you are basically doing the right things to keep the web alive. And maybe not put like a bazillion newsletters and pop-ups on your website, just saying. So yes, um, that's what I'll be doing. And today I'd like to talk to you about a topic that uh, is a little tricky for developers. Who here is a developer? Hands up. Designers? Cool. Who here is a marketing person? Who here is an SEO person? Cool. All right. We have a good mix. Can we do that one more time? Like developers, hands up. SEOs take note. Marketing people take note. Now who is raising their hands? Who is an SEO or marketing person? Raise your hands. Developers take note. You wanted to meet someone from the other side tonight, because that's what this is about. You all should work together again, instead of against each other, so find someone who raised the hand that is not in your group and talk to them tonight, and then I'll be very, very happy. But to be beginning this like, entire conversation, I would like to start with what on earth is SEO and how does that like, impact me as a developer? Because I'm not an SEO expert. Some people on my team are. I'm a web developer. I build stuff on the web, and I'm really excited about the web. But I also want people to come to my website, to come and see the stuff that I build on the web. So SEO is a thing that I should not forget about. And I would like to give you my personal definition of successful and good search engine optimization, uh, which is what SEO stands for today. But then we want to do like a technical dive. Because I'm a developer, I care about the technology side. So we talk about how do search engines even work and how do I get my content into a search engine and how does that, like, how does that work, how does that flow? And then once we understand this process, we can talk about the things that can go wrong or that can be challenging to get right and how we can you know, not make these mistakes or fix them if we have made these mistakes in the past. And last but not least, uh, as I have limited time, but SEO is a vast topic and search engines are very complex beasts. Uh, I would like to send you off with some pointers to learn more. Cool. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get into it. So, what on earth is SEO? Well, search engine optimization is about making sure that your content shows up in search and that people are actually coming to your website if they search for the thing that you are trying to accomplish or give them on your, your website or in your web apps, right? SEO is also a very broad field, and it depends on what you're trying to accomplish or where you're having challenges, what kind of SEO you should be looking at or what kind of stuff you should be doing. And also it depends on what you are interested in, what you might be looking into first. But I'll give you my personal definition. Are, it's not the only definition, it's not the right definition, it is my definition. And I would like to start with content. Because a lot of people underestimate that, right? It's like, if you have something that can help someone, you need to put it in words that these people would be using to find it. You need to understand who is it that I want to talk to? Who, who do I want to come to my web app or website? What do I want to give them? What are they looking for? What kind of words are they using? And if you're having terrible content, then nothing's gonna save you. No amount of 
bad ideas that I'm not going to name. No, um, no amount of technical polishing will help you. You can have the bestest, fastest, smallest website. You can have a website with all the JavaScript. You can have a website without, with no JavaScript. Don't build flash pages. But you know, you get the point. It doesn't really help if you don't have good content. And what is good content? Well, that depends on your strategy. What are you trying to accomplish? What is your final goal? Do you try to sell someone something? Do you try to uh, uh, sell them a product? Do you try to sell them a service? Is it that you want them to sign up to something? Do you want them to learn more about something and maybe then buy products? That depends on you and your business, but that's not something that you should ignore. Now, when I say these two things, as a web developer, when I read this, I'm like, okay, cool. The content is something that our marketing and sales people do. And the strategy is something that our business people and maybe like the PO and maybe the product designers uh, do. But where do I come in as a developer? Well, the technology side. Because if you have great content and if you have the right strategy for your business, but then your site does not show up in search, that's not going to be a great experience. You're not going to get people to find you. And you want to make sure that when you're building stuff, you're doing it right. Who here? before implementing a new site or project, thinks of SEO as a developer, or has developers that think of SEO. Wow, holy shit, two people. Uh, that's fantastic, keep doing that. But for everyone else, I have something for you uh, that you can take away, and probably also if you're, you're not here and your developers are not here, you can bring them something uh, to look into and maybe convince them that it's not a bad idea to do that. So I'm here for this, but just to make that very, very clear, that point is so important. If you are just focusing on technology and ignore everything else, it's not going to be great. It's going to be chocolate ice cream, right? It's not going to be exactly fantastic, and you might have this, and then you like polish it and put some sprinkles on top of it, but it's not really something different, right? So it stays chocolate ice cream, and that's not what you want. And I'll give you an example. So let's say I'm German, I like breakfast. I have proper breakfast at home or in the office. We have breakfast in the office, that's kind of nice. Anyway, so I do have breakfast and I do usually use toast. And let's say my toaster broke, so I cannot have the breakfast that I'm used to. It's a very emotional moment and I'm very vulnerable, but I feel safe sharing it here. So I need a new toaster. So I go onto the internet, and there's this fantastic startup from, I don't know, Silicon Valley, or maybe from Novistat, and they have this fantastic new device. And this device is called the Hot Bread. And then I go to their website, and I see smart, simple, beautiful. And I see, like, okay, so what is it? And then I read, like, it will disrupt your breakfast. I don't want my breakfast disrupted. I want a peaceful, quiet breakfast. It's in the morning. I just got out of bed, probably after not enough sleep. Don't disrupt my breakfast. Fix my breakfast. Make it more peaceful. And it's like, it's a thermochemical food processing. It's like, whatever that means. Is that like roasting? Is that toasting? Is that cooking? Is that, what is this? And it's like the best invention since sliced bread. Cool. Now, this page does not really tell me what this is about. Is this a toaster? I don't know. So let's look at the other links they provide us with. So here we have uh, our philosophy. I need a toaster, not a philosophy. Okay, cool. And then they have the hot bread X10. I don't even know what the hot bread is. What is this hot bread X10? What the hell? So, okay, but they have a call for, for, for action here. They have a call to action that says join the movement. I don't want to join a new religion. What the heck? What is this page? And this is for the developers and the SEOs. If you catch your marketing department, and also for the marketing folks, if you catch someone in your organization putting this kind of stuff on the website, tell them, we are making chocolate ice cream right now. This is going to be terrible. And let's just look at this. Like, same site, but I need a toaster. I come here, and it says the fastest toaster. Ah, so this is a website about toasters. I'm probably doing fine here. And it's like, never burn your toast again. Cool. Get your toast faster. Nice. And uh, try Toasty Mac Toaster Face. Okay, so Toasty Mac Toaster Face, cool. But what, you know, breakfast is important to me. It has like a, this cultural notion of, of breakfast. This is a, it's a ritual kind of thing. So I may not be ready for the commitment. How do I know that this is a good toaster? Or what is even, and then we come to philosophy. What is even a good toaster? If I want to learn more about that, how to choose a toaster? Nice. This helps me. I'm not sure if this is the right toaster for me. 
but they tell me what I should be looking at when choosing a toaster. That's very, very nice. And then um, they, have like a, uh, they have like a toasters overview, so I can probably compare them, and I can buy a toaster. It's all here. I'm good, I'm fine here. I, I know this is about a toaster. Maybe this toaster is not the right one, I don't know, but I can find out, and once I know which one is the right one, I choose it from the list of toasters, and then I click the big button and buy a toaster. That's it. That's what I mean with good content. I want to buy a toaster. I don't want to buy a disrupted breakfast or a philosophy or join a movement. Be clear what people want and what you can offer them and say it clearly and boldly. All right, okay, content, blah, 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 enough. Let's get technical. Now, luckily, when we do technical SEO, and that's the, 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 the side that developers are normally dealing with, uh, but you can help them with it if you're not a developer. We don't need a helmet, we don't need safety glasses or safety gloves. What we need is we need to understand how does a search engine work very broadly, and how do my pages get into a search engine so that people can find them. Well, I, there's plenty of search engines and they all work slightly differently, but there's like some very basic concepts that are always the same, and I'm gonna uh, explain and il illustrate them um, along what we do at Google Search because I happen to know how we're doing it. And we run a thing that is called Googlebot. Now, what does Googlebot do? Well, we start with a list of URLs. If we would be starting from day one, we would probably just like figure out what are the largest websites or the most important websites, and we like create a list or something, or like we ask people to submit their favorite websites, whatever. We have a list of URLs that point us to different pages. Cool. Now, we take a URL off of that list, and we basically have to do an HTTP request. We have to do what the browser would do. We have to get the content. We get, have to get the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript, and the images, and everything for this website. So we take that in. That's called crawling. So we, the first step is we just make an HTTP GET request for this specific URL, and then we get everything else that is associated to it. Cool. And then we can start processing what we got. So we got a response from the server. Hopefully the server says, this is cool, this page exists, here is some stuff. And then what we do is we look through it. If it's HTML, we can start looking through, does it have any links? And because if it does have links, then those are URLs that we can put back into this queue so that another instance of the crawler, like we have many little crawlers running at the same time, another crawler that has nothing to do will pick it up and do the same thing. The, the process starts again. So if I have a website with, let's say, like 100 products, I may have 101 URLs. I start with my homepage, and then on the homepage, I link my products, and then these URLs go back into the queue, and then the crawler goes, and, and that way, eventually, it will have found all my pages. Cool, that's lovely. The next thing, then, is we put it into a render queue. Now, what is this render queue? Well, the render queue is there because if you know how modern websites with JavaScript are often built, then they don't really have content. They just load the JavaScript. So if we are looking at the HTML we are getting, we just see a JavaScript file and nothing. So that's not fantastic. So we have to render it. We have to open the page with the browser, basically, and let the JavaScript execute and then look into it. So the web is really big. Googlebot knows over 130 trillion URLs. That's a huge number. And guess what? The cloud isn't infinite. There is a finite, a finite amount of computers in the world, so we can't render all the pages in one go. So instead, we're putting them in a queue, and once we have an available machine, we are rendering the page. So that's what's gonna happen there. At the same time, if we already know that there is some content here, we can put it in the index. And what does that mean? If the page is about toasters, we'll be like, this page is about toasters. It's the fastest toaster. It's the toaster that doesn't burn your bread. That kind of stuff. And then if I search for toasters, these pages are a candidate as a search result, and then They'll enter a different process. I'll explain that in a second. So once the page is in the render queue, eventually it gets picked up by what we call the web rendering service. That's basically a headless Chromium. It's a, it's a browser that runs automatically on a server and basically runs the page, loads the page, loads the JavaScript, executes it. And once that is done, we get the final HTML back into the processing stage. We look for links again and we index the content uh, and put it into our index. And once your page is in the index, it can potentially show up when I search for it, and that's called ranking. We look at many, many signals, so many different signals, to find out what is the best page for this user looking for a toaster. 
And then things like how fast is the website, for instance, is a signal, but that's only one out of many signals. So the ranking is a whole can of worms on itself. I will not talk about ranking tonight. We'll only talk about crawling, rendering, and indexing, because that's what you can definitely influence, and the ranking, if you have good content and a technically good site, you'll be fine, okay? So ranking, very different kind of worms, but we talk about these three steps. And pretty much every search engine has to do at least crawling and indexing. Some render, some don't. Google's bot does render, um, but it depends on the search engine and the, the crawler. But basically, those are the steps that our pages have to run through. Good, okay, that's, that's lovely. Um, we also announced at I.O. that we are now running a Googlebot that is evergreen. That means Googlebot, when rendering your pages or fetching your pages, is running Chromium 74 at this point in time, and we will be keeping it up to date with every stable release within a couple of weeks of a stable release. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to our blog and uh, find out more in detail there. Anyway, so we have a evergreen Chromium now, and sometimes you might hear people saying like, oh, you use, they use Chrome 41. No longer true, it's now an evergreen Chrome. So we, we said already like, okay, so this is what your website might look like, right? And oftentimes people are like, oh, we can't use this JavaScript framework, we can't use JavaScript at all, because if your website looks like this, you will not be in search. Well, it depends. If you care about search engines that do not run JavaScript or crawlers that do not run JavaScript, this page is a problem. For Google search, it's not. We are fine. We will render this page and we will index it, and unless there's like an error that prevents the content from showing up, as long as your page works, you will pretty much mostly be fine. But when I say mostly be fine, you know how it goes, right? There's a process involved. You build the site, we have to crawl, render, and index it, and things can go wrong. And sometimes it's the small things. So last year, I learned how to fly a glider. And that's pretty cool, that's cool stuff. A little risky and dangerous, but it's basically a cool stuff, and it's a relatively simple pro um, a process. You put your glider on a slope, you have like lines connected to the glider, and then you like, you pull, actually, yeah, you pull, you start walking down the, the rope, the, the slope, and then uh, you keep pulling, and eventually the glider comes above you, you check if everything is fine, and then you just keep running, and eventually you'll just lift off. Except when you make a mistake. So, I do what I have to do, I check gliders, fine, and then... And do you know why that happened? I didn't get hurt, don't worry. Well, a little bit, but not much. Uh, I'm still here today, so it can't be that bad. You know, maybe it hurt my brain, who knows. Um, the thing that I make, the mi mistake happens right here, that moment. You can see that my arms were like this. They should have been like this. Very small difference, theoretically, but very, very di big difference for me because I fell straight on my face. So, yes, sometimes web development is like that, and sometimes technical SEO is also like that. You make a small mistake, and it, I mean, you know, if the, the glider was there, so I'm like, yeah, it's fine, this is good, I can just like outrun it. No, you cannot outrun it. You will fall on your face. If that happens to you, that can also happen to you um, in, in uh, development. So, and, and sometimes I, I see people struggling with this. So it starts with, Martin, I have this website with like lots of pages, but they're not being discovered, like they're not showing up in search. And then my first question, unfortunately, this is 2019, I can't believe it, is still like, but do, how do you link to them? How are they connected? And I'll tell you why. So you might know, and I, uh, okay, so here's the disclaimer. I really don't want to talk about this, but I have to because people are still getting it wrong, so listen carefully, everybody. Strap in. This is a link. I know, this is like the biggest announcement ever made at a developer slash designer slash marketer conference, probably, because no one has seen this before. It's revolutionary. No, like this has been in HTML 1.0, and this is kind of the concept of the web is to have a link. Why is this a link? It's a link tag. It has an href attribute, and that points to a URL. Cool. This is also a good link, still an a, a, uh, at, um, tag, it's an href attribute, still a URL. Has an on-click thing for single page application transitions. Cool, that's fine, we don't care. What is this? Well, it's an a tag, but it doesn't go anywhere. There's no href in this. 
There's no URL where I could go. There's some on-click handler, but Googlebot doesn't click on your stuff. Googlebot does not click. It looks for URLs in link tags. This is a link tag, but it doesn't have a URL. No. Still not right. This has an href. Good job. Yeah, we can read the spec. Well done. The fragment is basically just a part of the document that I already have loaded, so this doesn't go anywhere. Again, we're not clicking, bad. This, no. Why, this is, no. If I would send JavaScript colon go to to someone and say like, put that in the, in the URL bar of your browser, nothing would happen. How would Googlebot use this URL to go somewhere? This is not gonna happen. I can't make an HTTP request to JavaScript go to. That's not gonna happen. No, what? That's a button. That's not a link even. The rule of thumb is, if it takes the user to different content, it's a link. Everything else, use a button, I'm cool. Fuck no. This. <sighs> no. This is bad. This is, not even screen readers know that this is a thing that goes somewhere. Just, and you actually type more characters. All right, let's not, let's not get into that. Just don't. Just use these two kinds of things and you will be fine. And when I say URL, that brings me to another topic. You want to be careful with your URLs. These are good URLs. Uh, the first one, has um, you know, the host and the path, the second one has the host and the path, and then this hash thing there. The hash thing means I want to address a specific piece of the content, so I have a lot of content already there on this page, and I wanna go to this specific part of it. Let's say like I want to Google toasters, and I go to the Wikipedia page on toasters, and then I want to know about the history of toasters rather than the best toaster models or something like that. Then all the content is there, and I can go straight to that part. Cool. However, when we invented single page applications at the very beginning, we didn't have a way to prevent browsers from changing, the, like basically reloading the page. We needed a JavaScript event and we needed a way to like not have it reload the page. Well, how did we do that? We abused the fragment, this hash part. So what we did is whenever you click on a link that has a different fragment than the link that you clicked on before, you would get a JavaScript event, and it would say like, your hash has changed to slash about. And then you could be like, cool, that's very good, thank you very much, I will now make a network request in the background, get the new content, and then do like some animations or whatever you wanted to do. Uh, be very, you know, single page appy. Very nice, except we are changing the content. The fragment is not for changing the content, it's for navigating a piece of content that is already there. The problem with this is, you're breaking the specification, you're doing something that is not supposed to be happening, and on top of that, crawlers don't crawl these pages. They're like, oh, so now like, the, the first page, this, the, the hash about is still like the home page, the hash team is still the home page, because it's just a different part of the content, but I have indexed the entire page, so I'll be fine. Except we won't. Yeah, but Martin, how do we build single page applications then? Oh, that's a fantastic question, 2014's calling. You have this wonderful, actually, yeah, maybe even 2012. Um, you have this wonderful your, um, API that's called the History API. It allows you to do pretty much the same thing and manipulate the browser history without the page reloading. So here you get clean URLs. You have to set up your server to serve them properly, but that's something that you should be doing anyways. So basically, these clean URLs are giving you a way to build single page applications without breaking the URL specification and without removing half of your content or most of your content from search engines. Woo. But Martin, we have to support enterprise clients and they use a browser that has an E very prominently put in their name. That's okay, that's cool. It's supported down to Internet Explorer 11. If you have to support older browsers, that is okay as well. They're just gonna reload the page, okay. But look, the thing is, the alternative is not, oh, but you know, if I use the hashes, it magically works. No, that's not true. What's gonna happen there is, if you are using Internet Explorer 9 or 8 or 10, what kind of computer will you be on? I give you a hint, it's not a MacBook like mine, right? Or if you're using Opera Mini, you're probably on a mobile phone that is pretty resource strapped or you just wanna save resources. So you don't wanna wait for JavaScript to do the thing. You want the page to load the new content as quickly as possible. And guess what? That's what a page load usually does. 
So you should be fine accepting that you can use the history API these days. It is fine. Just configure your server properly and you'll be having a good time. Cool. Now, then the next thing might happen. You might use Search Console, which is a fantastic free tool. You can verify your domain and then basically see how your pages are doing in search. You might see something like this. You might see this, this message, discovered, currently not indexed. Now, what does that mean? Now, what it means is this page, we found it. There was a link to it or something, and it is in the crawl queue. It hasn't made it from the crawl queue yet. But why not? I mean, you know, the crawl queue, how large is it? Well, that depends on your crawl budget. Now, what is crawl budget? Crawl budget is based on two components. The first one is the crawl rate. How often can we crawl pages on your site? Let's say you have a page with a million, uh, sorry, a site with a million products, but you are really skimpy, so you're basically using a Raspberry Pi under your desk to serve it. Now, we, want, we have this balance to strike, right? We have to make sure that we crawl your pages as quickly as possible, but we also don't want to overwhelm your Raspberry Pi and kill your server so no one can use your site. So we have to balance this, and that's what we call crawl rate. We're going to look into that in a second. Then there's also how often should we crawl these pages. That's called crawl demand, and that depends on a few factors that we're going to look into next. But first, let's talk about crawl rate. So when we are making HTTP requests, we look at a bunch of things. We look at what does your server say. In this case, it says everything's cool, and it responded quite quickly. It responded within 299 milliseconds while we were making 300 requests. We were sending you 300 crawlers, and they had like each had a connection, so we had 300 uh, simultaneous connections on your server. Everything was fine. Cool. Maybe we can crawl more pages? Let's try that. Ooh, okay, so your server still says fine, but it got significantly slower. So normally, that would be a signal to say, maybe this is, we should do a little less crawling here, or less fast. Um, because, you know, we don't want to overwhelm the server. But let's say just like, screw it, YOLO, we're going, we're going to go for it. So we're going to go for it, and then we get this, and we're like, oops, uh, shit. Okay, so backing carefully, back, and go like, sorry. Um, if you don't want us to try out what we can do, you can also use Search Console to tell us how much we should be, like, uh, what's the top uh, number of concurrent connections that we should be opening, so we don't have to do this kind of dance here. This kind of dance is fine, but there are a bunch of factors that affect this, right? So first things first, um, oh, well, we'll talk about that later, but first things first, let's talk about crawl demand. So I said, how often should we be crawling the page? And that depends on your page. Neither crawl rate nor crawl demand have anything to do with ranking. Your site will be fine. We will index your stuff as well. It's just a matter of how are we managing our resources and how much strain can we put on your server. But also, if your site is a new site, your content is going to change very often. And we notice that. When we crawl, it's like, oh, we crawled like 10 minutes ago and it's changed already, so we might want to have to crawl again. That's not a, a sign of quality. That's just a sign of, oh, this content changes often. So we might crawl this page quite often. If your page is about the history of toasters, I don't want to say the history of toasters is boring, but I don't think there's going to be like updates in a 10-minute cadence. So we can probably crawl this page like once every couple of weeks, and maybe it still doesn't change, and then we crawl it every couple of months. You know, we try to be smart here. We try to like increase the crawl frequency, still don't see updates. Well, then maybe we decrease it a little bit. The crawl demand, again, is just a measure for us to figure out how often does this content change and how often do we have to recrawl to keep the search results meaningful. Because if we crawl, uh, let's say, like some auction site, and you sh we show you auctions for a product that have expired a week ago because we just doesn't, like, we didn't recrawl the page in the meantime, Th that's not a good experience. So we have to figure this one out, but we can't crawl every page all the time because we, A, we don't have that many resources, and B, it just doesn't make sense. Cool, now what can in, in, uh, increase or, or decrease this? Um, well, you can tell us like how fresh is this content, you can give us like updated information, you can use things like PubSub or sitemaps to tell us, hey, there's a new thing that you should look into, and we might consider that. We consider that as a signal for crawling, like so you tell us there's this new page and we should crawl it again, cool, uh, we'll take a look at it. So your freshness is also a very important factor. Now, what can in, in increase or decrease your um, crawl budget? Well, the obvious thing is not just the pages count. 
And if you have style sheets, images, all these kind of things count towards your, your crawl budget because they influence the crawl rate. We make these requests on your server, so it might bring down your server if we do too many of these. So these count. XHR or fetch requests, so anything that you do in Ajax also does count towards your fetch as uh, your crawl budget. So if you have like plenty of API calls, you might want to consider having like a backend system that bundles them into one and then only does one request um, from the front end and only gets like one uh, request counted in the crawl budget. When we're talking about requests, specifically when we're talking about get requests, we do cache these. So let's say you have like 20 different products and they all use the same style sheet and we crawl them all in one go, then it's like, okay, number one, the main homepage with all your products. Number two is the style sheet of that homepage. Then the first product page, the style sheet was already crawled, hasn't probably changed within like a microsecond, so we're just gonna use that from cache. And then so on and so forth. So if you have 20 products, we're gonna end up with one, two, and then the 20 products, 22 requests towards your crawl budget. Normally you don't have to deal with this, only if you see that your pages are getting stuck in the crawl queue in Search Console, then you might wanna look into how to optimize these things. Uh, also, you wanna make sure that you're not having duplicated content or undesired content. We're gonna crawl these if we can, and then we're gonna be like, oh, so this is the same page as this one, so we're just gonna drop this. So you wasted a re request, that's a little pointless. Or if there's like something, let's say my high school photos on my website, why do I have the crawler go there and like fetch my high school photo if I don't want that to show up? Because, oh my God, no. I didn't have the fantastic hair, so that's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, if you use URL parameters, that is fine. We can crawl URLs with your parameters or parameter strings, but you don't wanna end up with like, creating an infinite amount of pages just because your server is not configured correctly, right? Um, I'll explain that in a second because that plays into soft errors. Soft errors are when your server says, it's cool, and then actually it's not. We make these crawls and we crawl these pages again, and that's a waste of crawl budget. So you wanna reconsider that. I'll explain the last couple of bits in, a more, in more detail now. But if you wanna learn about optimizing your crawl budget and crawl budget in general, there's a fantastic blog post. It's a little old, but it's basically still, it's the same thing. Like just look into it. Um, it gives you lots of valuable numbers and information and help uh, in how to troubleshoot your crawl budget if you have issues. So let's talk about duplicated content. So let's say I have a dog rating website and like people can rate pictures of dogs and then there's like one dog that is always ranking the highest and you can go to slash top dog to see that. But then each of these dogs has their own profiles. So if I'm looking for, let's say, um, Leica specifically, I shouldn't be going to the first uh, URL because this URL might change. Like it might be a different dog at that day when I click on it. So what happens here is we basically look at both of these URLs and figure out, okay, so this is this and this is this, so one of them is bullshit. And we're gonna, we're gonna crawl it, but we're gonna throw it away because it's the same as the other one. And at this point, how do, would we know which one is the right one? How, I mean, for us humans, it's, that's easy to tell, but there's examples where it's not that easy to tell, and then how do we know that? Well, we, we crawl both and we make a random decision. <laughs> that's not good. Hmm. But you can also tell us. So in this case, I put this into my HTML and I say, this dog, Leica, should be always found through slash dog slash Leica because that's gonna be always the same content. And then Google will be like, okay, so the top dog is like some random stuff and we're just gonna, okay, maybe we don't have to crawl it because it just keeps not pointing to a canonical so it gets like eliminated as a duplicate. So we save that request maybe, but definitely we save you the, the hassle of having like really weird search results. So you can use that, simple enough, but that's only a signal. Like sometimes people get it wrong most of the times people get it wrong, to be honest, like not most of the times, but like sometimes people get it wrong and then we end up with like really weird situations. So we look at that, we go like, okay, thank you very much for telling us that that should be the one. But if we have indicators and there's plenty of different indicators, I don't recall them all, but you can like look it up on the blog as well or in the, in the um, developer documentation. We look at different indicators and we might decide that it's a different one. I can give you one example. If you have a website that uh, sells stuff in, let's say, uh, Switzerland and Germany, both countries do speak at least partially German, so you might have the same content but different domains, .ch and .de, but you want 
both of these domains to be canonical, right? You, just, you go like, okay, so the .ch for Switzerland is gonna be the canonical for Switzerland, and the .de is the one for Germany. But it's the same page. It's the same content. Mostly, anyways. The, the currency and the prices might be different. Switzerland is always more expensive, I don't know. Um, so we might be like, yeah, thank you very much for telling us that these are individual pages and they should be canonicalized in different things, but they are the same thing, so no. We will still use this canonical. So if I'm coming from Switzerland and looking for your site or this particular product, I will see the .ch and I will be getting to the .ch, whereas the other one, because these are like country-coded uh, domains, right? So .de is a German one, so we'll show that in Germany. That makes sense. Or when I set up that I, will, I want Germany to be my, my location. Cool. It's useful. It's, it might not get picked, though. Um, what happens if I have my high school photo and I don't really, really don't want this to show up? Well, I can do two things, and not and only one of them will be what I want, actually. So I can tell Google, do not crawl this URL. Because before we crawl a URL, we ask your server, is there a robots.txt? And if your server says, yes, here it is, and you tell us, do not go there, then we'll be like, all right, sorry, we'll not do that. So you can tell us not to crawl a URL. But if someone links to this, we can't figure out what the page really is about because we can't crawl it. But we can put it in the index because the, the link might say, here's Martin's embarrassing high school photo. And then we know, well, Martin's embarrassing high school photo might be a thing that might be useful. It's, it, we don't know if there's better candidates, if there's better websites about this, then we'll use those. But if that's the only thing we have, then we might show it to the user because the user is looking for this and we have nothing except this one. So we're like, this might be not so great, but maybe try this here. So I haven't achieved my goal of making sure that it doesn't end up in the index. So what can I do instead? I can use an HTTP header or I can use a piece of HTML if it's an HTML page rather than an image and tell us do not index this. So we will crawl this and then we'll go like, oh, so this shouldn't be in the index. All right, so sorry, sorry for that. We're just gonna discard everything and it'll be fine. So you can block us from putting something into the index. You have that power and this is how you would do that. Now, the robots.txt can be very useful if you have some resources that are only like some analytics or trackers, we usually ignore them anyways, but sometimes we don't catch all of these. If you have like a customer chat widget, that counts towards your crawl budget, but doesn't really help you that much. So you might wanna say like, do not crawl these, just don't, just ignore this, okay? And we'll do that. But if you do it a little too aggressive, so this page shows cat pictures, or nothing as the testing tool says. So we are using like a, um, a tool called Mobile Friendly Test, I'll show you the link in a second. But there should be cat images, but there are none. Like, this is, this is empty. It says kittens club, but then it's empty, it's sadness. Why is it sadness? Well, there is something over here that says like loading issue. What happened? Well, the webmaster or the, the SEO at this page thought, I'm gonna be smart. I'm gonna save crawl budget on the API. We don't need to call the API. The API is internal, like we don't need that. And then block them in robots.txt. Now the JavaScript fetches the cat images from the API and, and, and our crawler goes, nope. We're not allowed to do that, so we don't see the cat images. So these cat images will not be indexed because we can't find them. The, the page is empty because your Ajax call failed. That's not good. So be very careful when it comes to that, and I highly recommend uh, mobile friendly tests. It doesn't just show you mobile friendliness, it also shows you JavaScript errors, it shows you page load issues, it gives you like a full console log. That's fantastic, that's a really, really useful tool. You can just paste any URL in and see how the Google bot would see this and you see the rendered HTML and then above the fold screenshot. Cool, now URL parameters. Let's say like we have a, a, a bunch of cats and this is one specific cat, cool. We can crawl this, we can index this cat. Nice, everything's good. Now, what about these? Are they the same? Are they different? I don't know, maybe like for some caching reasons they add the timestamp but the content is the same. Maybe we have like some session ID because the user who shared this link or put the link onto their website was logged in on this website, but it doesn't matter to us because we are not logged in when we use Googlebot. So these websites are all the same, but we wouldn't know that without crawling them and eventually going like, we crawl this, we crawl this, we crawl this. Oh, they're all the same, so we just throw these away. 
okay, cool, but how do I fix this? I can't, you know, I have to have users log in or I have to do this like cache busting in certain situations, so how do I deal with this? Well, the easiest way is you can just like tell us, you know, this page is actually just the, the first one. Like if you see the other ones, you redirect us to the first one and then we're like, okay, so we don't have to like deal with this request, that's fine. Also, what happens with this? So let's say I have a single page application or even worse, let's say I have a pagination. So I can click through multiple pages. But there's only five pages, but the server is misconfigured and I click on six, and six, like there's a link for six and I click on it and then it goes like, no products found. But the server responded, it's all cool, here's a page. So the same thing happens maybe in a single page application if I go to this URL that doesn't exist, right? So the website looks like this and it's, that's clearly an error, right? This is an error page, whoops. This page does not exist, that's not good. But unfortunately, your server says otherwise. Your server tells us, no, this is, this is cool, you're good, there, there is a page here. Mm, that doesn't make us happy. We try to catch that, we have mechanisms to catch what we call soft 404, so errors where the page is not existing that we don't catch with the HTTP status, but sometimes these go wrong and then you get something like this. And that isn't exactly great. So you don't wanna be the page that shows up like that. Um, and you know, normally that doesn't happen because we are pretty good at catching these, but sometimes we, we miss this. But what are you gonna do? Because the problem here is your, your server doesn't know which pages exist. Your JavaScript figures this one out, but then the server has already responded when the JavaScript runs. So uh, what can you do? Well, one way of dealing with this is in your JavaScript. So here we ask for the dog that was navigated to, cool. And then we check, does this dog actually exist? And if it does not exist, we're just gonna be redirecting to a page where the server is configured to tell us this does not exist. So Googlebot then knows, oh, all right, so this page actually doesn't exist, it's not here. We don't have to crawl this again because this is, or maybe we crawl it again when new links come in, but basically this page is dead and, and uh, we shouldn't be coming back here. We can also use meta tags. As I said, they have this like meta tags robots. Here we have a robot somewhere that says like all cool, index us, but now we change it to no index, which means this page will not be put in the index. That works as well. Now, what a few people have thought, including me, I made this mistake in a previous job myself, so I'll warn you about it. You might think, haha, I have an idea. So I will basically, when I know that the page uh, exists, I will set the meta robots to index, but every other page will not be indexed. So that will be a smart move, right? It's a simply a solution to say like, none of my pages should be indexed unless the JavaScript tells me it should. Um, is that a good idea though? Well, it isn't. But Martin, why is it a bad idea? Any, any guesses? Okay, so let's look at how the, how the pipeline looks like, right? We do take the URL, we make an HTTP request, we get the HTML, the HTML says no index. Cool, this page doesn't wanna be in the index, we can stop here. We don't have to render it if it doesn't wanna be in the index. But do you remember where the JavaScript is executed? Down here, whoops, all our pages are gone. <laughs> well, gone from search anyway. So other things that can go wrong are things where you might not expect it. So you have to probably implement GDPR. Who here had to implement GDPR on the website? The, the G, what, what's it called in Germany? Uh, it's like this privacy thing that you have to implement on your website. I'm very, very shocked that people are like, what? You can get sued if you don't do that and you have users in the U e e European Union. You don't have to be in the European Union, you will still get sued. So you might be like, okay, so we'll, we'll, on the homepage we have like this pop-up that people have to say, okay, I understand my privacy rights and I accept the cookies and everything, um, and that how my data is processed, I accept that, how the ads work, everything, cool, yes, cool. And then you set a cookie that the user accepted this and then on each other page, you check if this cookie has been set. Like if you're a news portal, you have different articles, but you don't wanna like have the code for the pop-up everywhere. So what you do is you check if that cookie is there. If it's not, then you go back to the homepage where the user can accept it and then they have to find the article again. Not a great user experience, but actually this is gonna hurt you in Googlebot because Googlebot is gonna get stuck here. Why? 
because Googlebot finds these article pages, but Googlebot does actually not save cookies, and that's not just cookies. We don't persist session storage, local storage, or index DB either. Googlebot is stateless because users coming to your page to search interactions to search results might actually not have set any cookies or anything, so we can't rely on the content to be there. And just imagine it, you click on a, on a search result for an article and you're being redirected to the home page. that's a really weird experience. So, you know, don't rely on cookies, don't rely on um, any kind of persisting data. Another thing is you want to make sure that you're really careful with detecting features. Just because I have a hammer doesn't mean that I have a nail. I need to check if I have a nail and a hammer before, because, before I can uh, hang up a picture or something, right? So the same goes here, but you want to be careful with this because you need to make sure that you're also handling errors. So let's look at this. So this is a new site that wants to show you content for the location that you're in, and that's fine except they're doing it slightly wrong. So they check if the browser supports geolocation. If it doesn't, they just load like some random global content, cool, like maybe top stories or something, who knows. But then they ask for the location. And what's gonna happen in the browser is a pop-up will appear, do you ac allow newswebsite.com to access your location? But what happens if I click no? Or what happens if my GPS, and I had a phone where the GPS was broken and all these websites stopped working for me because they were written like this. It requires this to be successful to load content. If it doesn't, then the else is not gonna happen. Because the, look, my browser supports it, cool, but I declined it or it doesn't work and an error happened and I don't see any content. That'll be Googlebot because Googlebot does not accept any of these permission requests. So this is a much, much better way. You are asking, does the browser support it? Yes, cool. In that case, please get me the location. If that succeeds, I load the local content. But if that fails for whatever reason, I'll just load the global content. So this is the safe way to go, you're, you're good. And if you wanna learn more about these limitations, we have a troubleshooter guide that you can check out. There's more things like this, uh, where you can like, see what problem you might be facing and what are the solutions that you could use or take. Also, make sure that your pages look good. If I search for, a, let's say, apple pie recipe, and I see the left side, Barbara's baking block, Barbara's baking block, Barbara's baking block, I don't even know what kind of recipe that's gonna be. Is it a, which of, which of these is the actual uh, apple pie recipe? I don't know. But if your pages tell me which one it is and use what I blocked out here, use a meta description, a meta snippet, and tell me like, this is what this page is about, I'll be much better. Unfortunately, most frameworks don't tell you how to do that in the tutorials. When you learn them, you might not use that feature um, that the framework provides you with. So I'll walk you through real quick. If you're using React, there's an extension called React-Helmet. React-Helmet allows you to use properties in the head to basically say like, my title is this, let's say like this recipe, like, you know, this dot re props dot recipe, and um, I can also put in a meta description that will be the little snippet under the title. So my, my pages look much, much better. Now you might not be using React, you might be using Angular instead, that's cool. Angular has it built in, uh, they're called the title and meta service, and they do the same thing. You use them to create a title and a meta description that is per page. And that is not, we are still not talking about ranking, by the way. Someone wrote an article, Martin says, the top three ranking factors. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you wanna make sure that you're doing this. For Angular, that's one way of, of making sure that your users, when they see your pages showing up because they ranked for other reasons, hmm, um, they, they see a title and a meta description that makes sense and makes them want to click. So it's better for you. For Vue.js, there's a package called Vue-Meta. Uh, you can use this the same way. It will use your props and, uh, and your data properties and basically put them into the title and meta description tags that you want to have there. Fantastic. So those are the three bigger frameworks. Other frameworks probably also have ways of doing this. Um, you can ask the documentation or you can like, go to the regular support forums for these frameworks if you want more information. I also put together a video series. If you want to share with other developers or if you want to learn more, there's eight episodes of me going through JavaScript SEO basics. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. It's on YouTube. Uh, leave a like and maybe a nice comment. Not a nasty comment. If you don't like it, just don't tell me. Um, that was a lot of work, God damn it! No, like seriously, just give us constructive feedback. We are also looking for season two topics. If you go to my Twitter, which is down there, 
If you go to my Twitter profile, there's a pinned tweet that where I'm asking for topic suggestions. So check out this, this series, look through the eight episodes, uh, and tell me what else you want me to talk about. You have basically like a couple of weeks until we are starting to record the next season probably. Cool, all of this is nice and all of this works fantastically well with Google search, except there are other crawlers that you might deal with. Social media bots, like from different messengers, from different social media platforms, other search engines might not run your JavaScript. Now what can you do about that? Well, you can use server-side rendering, uh, where you basically, whenever a request comes in, your server runs your application JavaScript. It has to be universal JavaScript for that. It runs your JavaScript, generates the HTML, and sends the HTML over so that all bots and crawlers can see this. If you use like open graph tags for the social media platforms that use them, if you're doing client-side rendering, they're not showing up, so you have to do something like this. But what if my page isn't as dynamic, if it's like a blog? The blog only changes whenever I publish a new post or edit an existing post. So do I really want my server to run the JavaScript all the time even though the content hasn't changed? Well, then maybe do pre-rendering. It's the same kind of concept. Whenever you know that you have to re-render it, you run your code in either a headless browser, like a uh, headless Chromium, Puppeteer, PhantomJS, or something else, or you actually write universal JavaScript and execute it so that you can generate uh, the HTML and then just store that HTML on your server and you'll be fine as well. The HTML is there, everything's cool. You can also use dynamic rendering. That's a workaround though. I would not uh, recommend it. If you can make the other two happen, make the other two happen or one of the other two. Dynamic rendering is a workaround that I'll explain in a second what it means. So this is what you could do in, in React for instance. You could use something like Next.js. Next.js gives you a way of basically when you're writing your components in a universal way to run this on the server side and, and hydrate it as the, the data arrives. So you would rewrite your app a little bit. Pre-rendering is also cool. Um, Pre-rendering crawls your page and basically uses a browser to render it into HTML and then you can deploy your HTML. The other frameworks have solutions for this as well. For Vue.js there's uh, the Vue uh, pre-renderer um, an SPA pre-renderer or something like that plugin. Um, then there's the Vue uh, server renderer, and then there's Nux.js. Angular has Angular Universal. There is ways for you to do that with your framework. This is what it would look like, for instance, with um, hybrid rendering in React. If, or sorry, server-side rendering plus hydration. What happens here is if our code runs on the server, the root node is empty. So we will start creating like a server renderer and we will render it into a string that we can then serve to the user and there's all the HTML. If the browser loads it, there is the HTML with all the children, so we can basically just add the JavaScript at the right portions and then we get a regular React application. So that's how, how that works. We can also do something that we call dynamic rendering. Let's say you don't wanna touch your front end code but you're okay doing something around your back end. What you can do there is you can check at your server what kind of user agent is asking for a site. If the user agent looks like a bot and all the bots tell you that they are bots, then you give them not just the JavaScript client-side rendered app, but you actually send it to a renderer. That can be a headless browser or something else, and that creates some HTML that it sends back. Some SEOs get very nervous when I say that because they're like, but isn't that cloaking? And I'm like, no, cloaking is when you tell the crawler, this page is about kittens and bunnies and unicorns, and then when a user comes and buy my drugs, that's cloaking, we'll catch that, and you'll have a bad time. If your site just looks a little different or like the CSS works differently or the content is just structured a little differently, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. It's a workaround though, so like this works. This is a setup that can get you indexed quite quickly, especially if you care about bots that don't execute JavaScript, but it has a few downsides. So I would say it's a temporary workaround before you can actually go full server-side rendering or pre-rendering because it doesn't give you a performance boost with users. Server-side rendering with or without hydration or pre-rendering gives you a performance boost because if the HTML starts arriving in the browser, the browser starts rendering the HTML because that's how this tree parsing works. With JavaScript, we can't do that. If we have to use JavaScript to generate all the content, we have to download all the JavaScript. It has to completely arrive over the network, not like the HTML, the moment we know that this is an H1 tag or something, we can start rendering it when we have the text content. No, 
we have to wait until it all has arrived, then we have to parse it if this is actual valid JavaScript, and once it's parsed, we can execute it, and then we can start generating things. And if you like add images or something, that means that only then we see these image URLs and we can start downloading them. Whereas if the HTML arrives, we can immediately start like downloading the images uh, as they come in. Very, very different performance, very different user experience. Dynamic rendering, because it only pre-renders and gives you HTML for crawlers, doesn't really do that. You can use dynamic rendering software to do pre-rendering or uh, server-side rendering, but I, I would just do it like properly uh, instead. If you want to learn more about this nonetheless, and if you need this workaround now, then we have a blog post that explains it. There's also a code lab that explains how it works, uh, and we have like a, a bunch of documentation. This is the documentation page um, that tells you more about how to implement this. Cool. So I'll, I have you know, wasted a bunch of time now, I guess. I'm very sorry for keeping you all here. But basically, let's wrap it up real quick. So I want you to test your pages. There's two fantastic tools that you can use today. One is the Search Console that monitors your entire site and even sends you notifications if something goes wrong. And then there's the mobile friendly test that gives you like JavaScript errors and rendering errors and load errors and, and all these kind of stuff and also mobile friendly errors um, where you can just like drop in any URL that you want. Even if it's a testing URL, that's fine. We'll, and this will do what the Googlebot would do. So hmm, that's fine. Um, if you can use server-side rendering or pre-rendering because it gives your users a better experience and it will work with crawlers that do not execute JavaScript. From a Google bot perspective, we don't mind that much, but you're just going to make your lives harder, really. Uh, also, I want to hi highlight or, or uh, basically um, bring home the point that you should help us understand your page, so use semantic HTML. Don't just make everything into a diff soup and use some CSS to make it look less terrible. Use semantic HTML, and if you have something that you really want to highlight, like a recipe or an article or an event, you can check out more resources on developers.google.com slash search. Uh, there's a thing called structured data that might give you benefits as well if you want to like, have your search results show up a little nicer. If you want to learn more, I think someone wanted to take a picture of this, so I'll be like 21, 22, 23, 24, okay, next. Um, if you want to learn more about this, we have plenty of guides and documentation available for you. So I would highly recommend you check that one out and give us feedback if you think it was good. If you think it was not so good, give us feedback as well. We want to help you all be more successful in search. Um, you can also watch the videos. Uh, as I said, eight episodes already out there. Um, we are looking for topics for season two. And if you have a question, do not write me a direct message because I can't answer these. If you find out my email, props to you. I won't answer that either. We can't give you preferential treatment. It has to be a public record. We have a way to do that. We have a, a webmaster forum that you can go to, or every couple of weeks, my boss and or I or someone else from our team will do like an online hangout that you can join and ask your question there. These are recorded, so if you can't make it in person, you can ask your question on the YouTube link that we share beforehand, and then you can watch the recording later if we answered your question. We can't answer all the questions all the time. That should be obvious. We only have so much time and so many questions. Um, so then just keep trying or use the webmaster forum. That's a, that's a good chance of getting uh, it answered as well. If you have specific questions about JavaScript, there's also a public mailing list that you can get into. It's called the JavaScript Sites Working Group. Um, if you are really focused on a JavaScript problem, that's the best place to go. Because both on the Webmaster Forum as well as the Webmaster Hangouts, we also answer non-technical SEO questions. So this might not be the best forum for technical questions. Um, you can follow our blog. Our blog has a bunch of updates coming every now and then. Uh, you're going to stay up to date there. Uh, another way of, of staying up to date is following our Twitter account where we tweet stuff and we tweet about like things going wrong or things that we learned or the new blog posts or new features in Search Console. So those are fantastic places to stay on top of things in terms of SEO, especially technical SEO. And with that, I'd like to say voila, and um, thank you so much for having me.